Well, hey there, everybody. It's Brian Burns. Welcome to this episode of the Brutal Truth About Sales and Selling Podcast. I hope everybody had a fantastic Q3. Here we are going into October in the last quarter of the year. And boy, it's going to be a great one. Hey, I got an interesting interview today. Uh, We're going to be talking about how to work a room. And this may sound like, oh, well, I don't do networking events. Neither do I. Or, Or, you know, seminars or trade shows. But we all go into parties. We go into company meetings. We go into social events where we may know one or two people, or we may know a few, and we want, we have an objective. We want to get to meet somebody, connect with people, build or start a relationship with people. How do we do that? And this is a, a great interview. I really enjoyed it because I had, um, I'm not good at this. I'm terrible at it, and I need to become better at it. And I've always had these bad things where I'd stick with the same person through the whole night. I just get comfortable with somebody or I'd be a wallflower and just uh, hang out or just hang out with somebody I already knew. And I never really worked it, never really got a lot out of it. And, uh, you know, without a real agenda, I I just didn't feel it wasn't my bag. So we're going to be talking about that and see how we all can become better at this because it is something that we have to play into and the face-to-face networking ability, not necessarily networking events, but conferences, uh, user group meetings, company meetings, where we really should connect and expand our network instead of staying in our little comfort zone. I think this is a a really important skill and something that I, I definitely need to work on. Also, hey, on Friday, uh, CoVideo uh, kind of gave us a sneak, not even a sneak peek, kind of a teaser that they're coming out with some great capability. Now, they already have the Chrome plugin, which is amazing. And now I think they're coming out with something good. So keep an eye on them. I would follow their company page, CoVideo, C-O Video, all one word. And I think video this year has been insanely powerful for me. It's been a 10x differentiator. Now, you know, not 10%, 10 times the kind of following, the coverage, the expansion of the podcast by me doing a lot of videos, videos on YouTube, videos on LinkedIn, Twitter, you know, pretty much everywhere uh, that people want to engage with video because text just isn't connecting and email. When you get that, it's a little, you can't help but think it's personalized and you want to play it out of curiosity and people will engage with you. Also, guess who else has got a Chrome plugin? <laughs> I mean, you got to check this out. Nudge it's Chrome plugin now works within LinkedIn. So you can very quickly see how you're connected with people through your network on LinkedIn. Insanely powerful because this is how we have to engage with people is through our network. We don't necessarily have to get an introduction from people, but even referencing a common person. And even if the the third person doesn't even know that second person, it just brings out that, hey, we've got something in common. And you'll get out of this discussion today that commonality is the root of everything. And at the very end, I'll update you on the courses. I'm now offering one-on-ones at no cost to people who are in the course to talk about the course, of course, <laughs> not just um, uh, your, your job situation or anything else, your career plans. And if you're interested in learning more about the courses, first check them out at b2brevenue.com. And it's under training. There's a tab there with the link to all the courses. You can see the table of contents. And it's beauty beautiful about it is it's not just videos. It's not just a video course. It's a year-long journey where you become part of a community where you can have access to me one-on-one at no cost to talk through your deals, to talk through your approach, to get feedback on it, to get ideas, inspiration, to kind of you know just have a partner in crime to help you through this year, to get your game from wherever it is to where you want it to be. So it's not a boring course. You have office hours where there's group questions. You can email questions at any time. You can schedule a one-on-one. It's all in that first chapter of the course if you've already bought the course. All the links are there. My calendar link for one-on-ones, the Zoom link for the office hours. It's all there. And my email address and phone number where you can have access to me. Uh, I don't pick up the phone, but you leave voicemail and I will get back to you. And I put all the content back in the course so that everybody can benefit from it. 
Hey, are you checking out Discover Org? They are just cooking. They were ranked number one by G2 Crowd. And data is becoming so critical because everybody's moving around. Everybody's sharing information that we can use to connect and engage with them. So why not just get it from one place instead of searching every place, validating it, having these information concierges? Oh, God, it's so much work. Hey, let's get into the interview. I'll sum it up at the end. Hey, Susan, thanks for joining us today as a way of getting started. Tell us about yourself. Okay, well, I am, and I might I always will admit this, a former public school teacher of Chicago and San Francisco. And then San Francisco had a massive layoff of 1,200 teachers. And I designed a career change workshop for teachers. And out of that begot a speaking business, a writing business, authorial opportunities, so that if anyone's ever said, oh, I'm facing a layoff, I go, thank goodness for mine. But I, I'm... You know what I could, what could I say? I'm a, a lot of still Chicago deep dish pizza eater. And uh, I kind of dabble in being a sports fan, but I'm a ballet fan for sure. Yeah. I miss that Chicago deep dish. Um, Uno's used to be really big where I used to live. Uh, they kind of went downhill after they be, got bought out, I guess. When they decided, and this is an interesting for our people to say, I want to scale up my business. As soon as they scaled up and sold to a bigger yeah. whatever, and then there were everywhere, they were even in San Francisco. One day I brought a friend from Chicago here. He goes, sliced actual tomatoes on a pizza? I never heard of that. <laughs> so sometimes the scaling up, while everyone thinks that's the way to go, can be the demise. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, you let the accountants take over. Now, you have a real passion for um, people going into a room and working it. Now, is, did this come out of the, the career change? Yes, um, <clears throat> because I did this and I started my business and I was speaking. Someone said to me, um, what would you charge me to speak about being laid off and starting this business. And that, for anyone that wants to speak, after you've given a little presentation and someone says, what would you charge me? That means you can be a paid speaker. But I, when I designed the Career Change Workshop, do you know, Brian, I didn't have the confidence to give any one of the segments of the workshop. But what I was was the MC. And I don't know if people who've given speeches have done this, but in my opening and welcoming, um, I practiced it 15 times. Yeah. <laughs> Did it come out well? Yes. And that what people discovered is I was very supportive of teachers and our skills. And by the way, George Bernard Shaw was wrong. People who teach can do. <laughs> and we're doing a lot of things worldwide. Madeleine Albright taught and yeah, Roberta Flack, the singer taught and Sting taught. Now, a lot of you might think, oh, of course he taught music. No, he taught English. So there. No, no. Teachers. There, you know, Where people, would we be out without teachers, huh? Exactly. So my whole thing is we have a lot of skills and people said my MC actually was a good thread to put the whole day together. And people said, oh, my goodness, I felt better. And you were funny. And now, how do you write a whole book on this, though? Is there that much to it? Well, it's funny you should say that, because one of the acquiring editors, who I still have her refusal rejection letter in my drawer, you think I would have gotten over it, um, she wrote that, oh, this couldn't be a book, but it would make a wonderful article. But I'm going to tell you, for those people listening who want to write a book, how much some of these editors know, she wrote my agent and said, however, I'm going to an event tonight and I'm going to use many of her techniques. <laughs> so excuse me, dumbbell, if you're using the things I wrote in the proposal, would it not occur to you that this could be a book? And it's, it, the first iteration of How to Work a Room was 200 pages. The 25th anniversary edition was 300 pages because there's more and there are more rooms and there are more online rooms. Yes, because, you know, it's a little different if you're going to 
high school or college reunion than it is when you're going to a trade show. So there were chapters that were specific for different issues. And I also, I didn't know that they'd let me do this. The first book, my favorite chapter, Mr. or Ms. Slee's Works a Room or How Not to Do It. And there's a lot of that, isn't there? And not only is there a lot of that, people would call me and say, oh, you missed this. I met someone who did this. That should have been in your book. What we really want to do when we walk into a room, feel comfortable, feel confident, meet people. And here's the number one, uh, I would say, uh, mission you should have. Make people in the room comfortable with you. And when they're comfortable, then you're comfortable, then you're in a conversation. But if it's all about, oh, my God, I'm I'm shy. I'm an introvert. I can't talk. I don't want to talk. I don't like the way they look. Oh, their title isn't that important on their name tag. Don't do that. Switch your thinking. And that's it, because I think a lot of us, and certainly I'm speaking for myself, you feel very confident in a certain context. And then all of a sudden you get thrown into a different context and it all of a sudden you're an introvert or you're a wallflower. I'm sure we all remember back in high school that first dance. It was I've got to believe it was harder for women, for men than for women. Because men, yes. men had to do the walk across the hall there. And but that, that then we grow up and we go into conferences and company meetings and uh trade shows and happy hours and we have to face this all the time, don't we? You know, do you remember the game Red Rover, Red Rover, where people were in tune lines and you invited someone to come over? It, really, I think life is very much like you just described it, trying to cross that little line over to the neck, the other people to ask them to dance. And the, I think that, that there's a, a lot of that that still goes on. We, we revert back to, oh, my God, I'm so nervous. And but if we... Go ahead. And that's it. And even as adults where we go to a party and we may only know uh, the person we went with or may know nobody or just the host and everyone kind of goes into clicks. And that's a lot like trade shows or conferences. There's people who already know each other and they're the people who they should not be talking to. They should be talking to new people. That's the whole point of a gathering. And so we you have the wallflower on one end and the uh, the gadfly on the other handing out their business cards as fast as they can. Um, but that's not, neither of those is the objective. No. In fact, I love the word, you could, the gadflies. The person that is just handing out cards because they think they're dealing blackjack. <laughs> uh, I, I have that Vegas vision in my head. Um, they're not working the room right. It, it, because... Working the room, and let me define it, is moving comfortably and confidently in a room, meeting, greeting, connecting, having conversations, having a little nosh while you, you know, go through, but really having those conversations that are the start of what with follow-up could be the business or personal relationship over time. But if you're just tossing out cards, and by the way, tossing out cards is an expression that I have a feeling is going to go away soon. The last few events I were, I was at with millennials, oh, do you have a card? They go, what, have a card? No, here, I'll take a picture of your card. Here, where are you in LinkedIn? They don't have cards. So the person that throws out cards really makes a couple of basic errors because if you haven't talked to someone, well, they're interested in knowing you further Tossing out a card to them, they're going to just toss out your card. Yeah, they are. I mean, because they're only going to keep it and remember it if they find value to it. Uh, well, let's, let's take a step back. What What is the mindset that we should have when we go to an event, a meeting, a room? The mindset should be, I have, and listen, this is, I have an opportunity to meet new people in my field, in adjacent fields, and in new fields. And listen to how I said it. I get to meet new people. Someone who was in one of my uh, presentations said, 
she and her husband went to Chamber of Commerce events. They have a business. And they'd go and go, oh, God, who am I going to meet? Listen to that tone. Then one day they met two people, and they had a great time. So what they did consciously after that is when they were getting ready to go to any business or social event, they out loud said, oh, I wonder who we'll get to meet. That That's a, mindset. That's a great mindset. And once you walk in the room, how much rehearsal should you have? How much planning? How much thought should you put into it? Okay, I would say this. You have to prepare before you even step inside the room. May I share some items, the practical items I tell my audiences to Please. prepare to make it easy for them? Um, number one, have your own and it's a, a seven to nine second self introduction. It's not a 15 to 30 second to one minute elevator pitch speech, which you shouldn't even give in an elevator because no one walked into that tiny room to hear you go on. And, <laughs> go on for a whole minute. <laughs> oh my God, please get off at the next floor. Um, you could tell I'm not an elevator pitch person. Um, because sometimes you can walk into an elevator. And there's the very person you want to meet. And they're in a conversation with someone else. It happened to me when I was at CNN in New York. I mean, one of the big um, celebrity interviewers was there. And I go, oh, he should meet. He was in such an intense conversation that, that I, I'm 4'11". I, I wanted to shrink to 4'2", to disappear in that elevator. It would have been inappropriate for me to burst out in my elevator pitch. So you have to understand time and place. But everywhere you go, before you go, take five minutes. Oh, take five. Good title for a jazz song. And all those jazz buffs out there know what I'm talking about. Um, think about uh, who's in that room. Think about how you would introduce yourself. So the first is seven to nine seconds. The second Please say your first and last name. Uh, my name's Susan. Do you know how many Susans can be in a room? Bob. How many Bobs can be in a room? First and last name. And also link it to the event so that people have a context for why you're there. My friend Patricia Fripp, who's an amazing ex speaker and ex executive speech coach, said, Rowan, tell people don't give your title. Titles mean different things in different company, different companies. Give the benefit of what you do. Oh, I turn people into mingling mavens. Oh, what's a mingling maven? Oh, a maven's an expert, and I wrote how to work a room. Someone then invites you to explain or share more. But if you give them context and you give them the benefit, you help them start the conversation. Okay, so that's good. So that's how you describe yourself and the benefit of what you do. How about as far as questions for the other person to see uh, if they're uh, somebody that you'd like to work with, get to know more about? Well, the first thing is after you introduce yourself, um, you stop. The person might say, oh, what is that, whatever, is that company? And then you can tell a little bit and then you stop. And here are the magic words that will start a conversation, give you an idea of if there is a connection or not. You turn to the person and say, and how about you? That's great. Yeah, great segue. And how about you? Then if they, I, I, if they don't like their job but they love what they do as a volunteer, you invite people to talk about what they're interested in. And it could be their job if they decide to offer that, or it could be, you know, that they're volunteering at the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society. You know, you give people an opportunity to talk about what they want to talk about. And then you're engaged in a conversation. In terms of questions, I want to share this with our listeners. I also wrote, what do I say next? And the reason I wrote, gave it that title is people would say to me, okay, I know how to work a room and introduce myself. What do I say next? Ah, that's the title for my conversation book. Here's, here's what you do. If you think that, and unfortunately, Dale Carnegie wrote this in his wonderful book, 
that you just ask questions because you get people to talk about themselves, which is their favorite subject. Here's my Chicago part coming out of me. Don't do that. If all you do is ask questions, you're a nosy, curious, invasive interrogator. Because those of us who get asked too many questions, I just finally look like, what's it to you? I go back to the old ways from my old old town city. What's it to you? We got a lake and we got cement shoes. But reality is the conversationalist doesn't just come with questions. You come also with knowing the news. There is no reason now not to know the news. I used to say this for years. I don't care if you read it in print, which I do, online, which I do, or Dick Tracy and you read it on your watch. Who knew two years ago they'd start reading the news on their watch? But, um, and I'm impressed they can actually see it. However you get your news, you may get it through um, a content curator. Don't go anywhere where you don't know what's going on in the profession, in the community. And it's so easy, go to a website, Uh, go to content curator, Uh, do a Google search, go to LinkedIn pages of people that you might know might be there. There is no excuse to walk in cold to any event. Just now, a little work. Um, I guess that that is true. I, I've always kind of taken that question thing, and it's worked really well for me. But once in a while, you run into somebody who's not a talker, and and they like they want to hear somebody else talk. Yes. And thank I, you. I guess it is you know so contextual. You know, time, place, but then the person you're talking with. Not not everybody's the same. Um, some people don't want to have questions. I've met other people that talk all night. They never ask you even your name. <laughs> right? Yeah, and my cousin told me about a guy she went out with eight times who did that. And I said, really, you went out with him the second time? <laughs> I mean, he never asked you anything about yourself. And he did. No, 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 no. We don't want to be the person that's the executioner questioner, but we also, if we are interesting and interested, that's the dynamic combo. Yeah. And to Um, to know which one, I guess, to pull at the right time and to the the right extent, I guess. But here's something else. You just said this, and some people don't like to be asked questions, but people love to people to tell them a story instead of saying I have a dog you could tell about oh my gosh I came home and I found that I my brand new pair of shoes that the you know the laces were missing and I saw them coming out of my dog's mouth I mean tell a story people connect with stories they don't connect with facts so if we will bring in and this is the Susan Rowan ultimate advice and all that Bring who you are to what you do. You have, a lot of us have pets, we have parents, we have children, we have neighbors, we had trouble parking, um, we have a favorite team, we just saw a movie, etc. Bring the essence of you to every room. Because what you just said, Brian, we don't know what people will connect with. It may be you find out that this person's daughter is uh, playing uh, division one volleyball at a college and your son is hoping to be recruited to do that the following year then you have a volleyball conversation who would have thought and that that's it so so build off of commonality or or seek uh to find commonality because i'd always start with you know the obvious things that you have in common you know the venue the music the food um like you described, the parking, the weather, and, and because everybody can talk about that, and everybody is currently feeling that at some okay. level. But what you just said is what I've written. This is exactly what you do. You start off with what you have in common. And I know people say, oh, I never make small talk. I, it, oh, I think it's boring. I hate making small talk. Really? You're going to talk about the war? Or right. the- You're going to go from, hi, I'm Susan. We're gonna- <laughs> what do you think of Trump? 
<laughs> yeah. Or I think there's famine in the world. I'm famished right now. Where's the dessert table? Uh-huh. You know what? If, what you just said, if you had trouble parking, so did they. If you had traffic, so did they. If it's 98 degrees. I was in Washington, D.C. Um, earlier this month. It was 94 and humid. And um, I, I walked eight miles. To which my my trainer said, you would have thought you lost weight, Susan. Well, I didn't. But, you know, these are the things we talk about when it's that hot out. We talk to strangers as I was standing in line to get into the phenomenal Museum of African-American History. People were like waving fans across our faces. People talk to each other about the weather, if it's raining, if it's snowing. If the food is delicious, I can't tell you how many conversations I've had with people at a dessert table. And this is the Roanne special tip. Every event you go to, if it's a buffet or like little tables of gnashing food, if you want to meet the friendliest, most open people, go to the dessert table first. Yeah. And what's the, what, what's the correlation there? Is that people have already had the meal and they're not no. famished, <laughs> but they wanted no. something sweet? No, you want to talk to the person that's eating fun food. That okay. means they're in for a good time. And you could say, oh, my God, that chocolate cream puff looks delicious. I wonder how many calories it has. Or would you recommend it? Oh, you can eat. Food is the best conversation starter. Yeah. Chocolate is not a bad place to start. But as I have said, and I hope these cut up vegetable people don't get upset, I've met more interesting people at the dessert table than I ever met at the cut-up vegetable table. That's true. Yep. Is the, yeah, the people, the nitpickers, probably, I guess you have to align on the nitpicking characteristic, I guess. I, yeah, you know, you want people who are relaxed, having fun. If someone's popping a mini eclair in their mouth, that's <laughs> the person I want to talk to. <laughs> and, and the bar. The bar is always easy, too. The the bar is easy. The bar, you have to be careful um, because this is where I'm going to be the killjoy. Oh, Jesus. I I know. You're not going to like this, Brian. If you think there's an open bar and the drinks are free, and I've written this in all my holiday do's and don'ts party tips, you will pay for that drink one way or another. You do not want to be known as the hail, well-met, and over imbibed person you can always have a drink in your hand but you and it depends on how well you hold your liquor that's the other thing too i can't and it they have calories and i'd rather put it in a chocolate brownie but you can have a drink but just because you can drink three or four drinks at an event you know what it doesn't mean you should because it's still business and that's hard to do sometimes because you got um, the correlation of the nervousness. Um, alcohol is a great lubricant. And then all of a sudden you feel better. And maybe one more will make me feel even more better. <laughs> that's right. It's the, and you know that movie, More Better Blues. Yeah. That's what you'll end up with, the More Better Blues. Because here's what you just said. Alcohol is a lubricant. What you want to do in any event is be comfortable, be confident, be relaxed, make other people comfortable with you. But you don't want to be so lubricated that you are not in total control of what you say, because we all know of people who've lost jobs, lost promotions, because their slightly inebriated behavior did not go well. Now, help me with my problem in these events is that I tend to not be able to move around. I, I, if I find somebody that I click with, uh, I befriend them, yet I spend too much time with them. How do you politely and... Dump them? No, not, to, not dump, <laughs> not, not that they're not good. It's just that you're not there to meet no, one person. Fun. Yeah, you, you want to meet three or five or whatever. Um, and, and if you do it too fast... I mean, you can do it really fast and it's not awkward, but then there's this kind of weird stage where you've been, you're joking around, you've got great rapport. They may be a great business associate, but you want to, you want to meet, you know, two or three other people there or other people are waiting for you. Well, 
first of all, what you just said is the number one question that I have been asked since, not even since How to Work a Room came out, but before in almost every presentation, corporate, convention, et cetera. It's how do I move on? So may I give the three gracious exits that I share with people? Hit us up. Okay. It's the number one issue that people have. The first one is you've talked to someone. You, you, it's actually not appropriate to hog someone's time at an event. They're also there to meet people. Sometimes people glom on to you because you are nice and they are uncomfortable or shy or an introvert. But this is what you do. You, you have to move on. You can say, and you interrupt yourself, not them. You offer your hand for a handshake because that also indicates it's over. Hey, it's been so interesting to talk to you about uh, the price of barley in Boise. I just made that up. So that what you do is in a phrase, you summarize what you talked about so they knew you were listening. Um, if you want their card and they haven't asked for yours, you could say, do you have a card? If they say, well, I don't have one that, oh, well, perhaps we can, let me take a picture of whatever. Let's go to LinkedIn, fill it in on my phone. If you're talking to a millennial or someone out here in Silicon Valley, but figure out a way to connect. And if you have cards, you could save them. May I offer you one of mine? But when you meet that person that you want to follow up with, you have three days. Send an email, send a LinkedIn, send a uh, Facebook, whatever you do, send something that says, hey, it was great talking to him. Really glad we met. Uh, let's discuss this further. So that's one. But here's the magic. The, the goodbye can't be the 40 minute goodbye that I got accused of doing several times. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, people really. If anyone's with you, they actually want to drag you out of that room. So you, you, the goodbyes have to be to the people hosted, to the people you've met. But when you are talking to one person, you then finish up by walking a quarter of the room away. Don't just turn your back. Walk away to someone, and listen to this, standing alone or another group. You don't say, oh, I need a drink. And you never say, I have to go to the bathroom. That, that's way too much information, inappropriate. So that's one. But if you stand in the same area, then you really have turned your back on them. You don't want that reputation. The second exit is, what do you do if you talk to the person that was like pulling teeth and it was awful? You can't say it was lovely talking to you. Um, what you say is, with a nice smile and your best good manners, put out your hand and say, oh, I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference, the meeting, the party, the whatever. Because that person may be disengaged because they found out, you know, that their son, you know, was taken off to somewhere, you know, he broke a leg, he was off the basketball court or mother might have fallen or got wind of a layoff in the company. You don't know what's distracting people. We all think they're dis disinterested in us. And the reality is most people are preoccupied. They don't mean to be rude, but something else is going on. So we never want to be rude back. We want to keep the door open. With a, so a nice, firm handshake and a smile, oh, I hope you enjoy the rest of the event, without saying you've enjoyed talking to them because you haven't, kind of saves the grace for the next time. And you still walk a quarter of the room away. And then there's a third exit. And it's actually not an exit. It's called a bring along. And this is what savvy networkers do. And I wrote Secrets of Savvy Networking. And I watched people who were really um, savvy in how they connected with people. You're talking to someone. And you say, oh, I think I see so-and-so. Um, have you met them? Why don't you come with me and I'll introduce you? the bring along. That way you're taking that person instead of leaving them standing alone, you're helping them increase their 
contacts, their comfort, their network. And, is, and did, then do you then pass them off and go on? Well, Depends. No, you stay in the conversation a bit. And then here's something people don't realize. Conversation's organic. So there's the three of you. Then a fourth person might come up. And then two of you talk and the other two talk. You know, some things just happen organically. And you don't pass them off. I love that. That's a great expression. You never want to give the impression that you're <laughs> passing people off. But what you do is you stay included. And then, you know, you may find that those two people, which is why you saw that and picked that, have something really in common. And it's appropriate that you let them have the conversation. Or another party might join you and the original person you went to meet left and the three of you are there. I think we overthink this, but there is another, those three ways to exit graciously and gracefully. You know, Brian, a lot of people are talking about reputation management and they think of it as their online reputation. And I've written tweets, I don't know, I send the same tweet out 10 times. No point in managing your online reputation if you don't manage your face-to-face -face reputation. Well, I like all of those because none of them are insincere or manipulative or trickery. They're all very sincere, very honest, and completely above board. Thank you. I have read people that recommend things that are so blatant trickery. They are so stylized. They are so... Well, this, you, yeah, some, the false time constraint or, oh, I've got to make a call or, yeah, and it, th those aren't, those are, you know, social little lies, but. but. You just said something and thank you for bringing that up. And I just listen. I just watched a video of Simon Sinek who wrote something, why or. Start with why. why, yeah. Start with why. He did a thing that I've been, I've written about it since How to Work a Room. So it's been 30 years. By the way, How to Work a Room will be 30 years in November. And we're giving it a big online party. Um, and he said, you don't, when you're with people, have your phone at a table. And just because you turn your phone face down, you're still rude. <laughs> I was like, yeah, yes. It's getting pretty scary nowadays, isn't it? Right. And the other thing is you you have your phone off. There is nothing that says you are not important more than, oh, oh, I'm just going to glance at my text. <laughs> Wait a second. I got a new follower on Instagram. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you. Really? Um, oh, no, I'm at 30,002. But who's counting? <laughs> you know, let's let's use a little common sense. Back in the day when I first wrote the book, we didn't have this. And the number one offense people said people made is they would be in a room, they'd be shaking someone's hand, and they attributed it to politicians, which, by the way, it's not politicians. They've been schooled. It's the rest of us who look over the person's shoulder to see who's more important, better title on there. To, don't. Do great, that. Great minds think alike. I can't tell you the number of salespeople that I've noticed that with. They're, they're, they're standing there talking to you, paying no attention to you, scanning the room, trying to find somebody more important. And there's it's, nothing ruder. It's, how about this? Not only ruder, hey, folks, there's nothing more memorable. So, by the way, when you found out that person you didn't think was that important because either they weren't wearing the right outfit or they didn't have a big title on their name tag, they own 51% of the company you're trying to get a job with. You ain't getting that job. You aren't making that sale. So, you, and this is to sound like my grandmother and everybody's grandmother, you never know. And this, uh, this is going to be a rude awakening for a lot of people. Because we don't know who people live next door to, are related to, whom they went to school with, and who their overall networks are. This, If you heard this from your parents and your grandparents, this is the reason why you have to be nice 
to everyone. Definitely. I can't tell you the number of times where you find somebody who happens to be related to, neighbor of, and on both the positive and the negative side. And when yes. And I've told the story about a friend's wife who needed to uh, get access to this brain surgeon. And I talk about work in a room here. This was this handicapped uh, medical student who worked down the hall from him. And me being the wallflower, me and him were just hanging out talking. And we ended up talking the whole night. And he he worked at Johns Hopkins. And and my friend needed access to this doctor. and And I just texted this guy. I go, I have no idea if you know who this guy is. But any help you could give me, I'd appreciate it. He goes, he's right down the hall. Let me um, get his secretary to email you. Boom. Oh, my goodness. You have just sent chills down my spine. Folks, it isn't always about business. When we pay attention to the needs of people we know, and we're in a room, just like what you said, you never know. You were able to give someone access to someone that they needed Because you weren't selfishly thinking about your next sale and your next comment. And I know a lot of people think it's all about the business and the revenue. But what you just said is what you did, it's about life saving. Yeah. And, you you know, the six degrees of separation, I think it's down to three degrees. I mean, Absolutely. nobody has a fourth connection on LinkedIn because it, it, it mathematically doesn't work. You only have three levels of connection. That means that everybody on the planet's only one person away from you. Right. And now that everyone's going to 23 and me, we found out we're all cousins. Yeah, so so we can't have um, be pointing the finger anymore. And by the way, and it's true because I just went to a Friday night dinner here in Tiburon, and oh, this one woman. I mean, I was like awed of her. I mean, she was like uh, the, the PhD attorney speaking all over the world, addressing congresses of different countries about data and data abuse and blah blah blah, and. And I won't give you the whole story, but I come to find out that the grammar school she went to in Chicago, and we're standing in Tiburon, California, I said to her, because I knew the principal, I said, so you know Trudy? And she looked at me like, I can't believe it. And not only did she know that person, but because my uh, my brother actually taught a couple classes there. He was an attorney in the city. She knew my brother. Yeah. It, oh, it's a good thing she didn't say anything bad about him. No, but you know, you never know who people know. Now, let me tell you what happens when we find out that we have something of interest in common or someone especially we know in common, the conversation changes and you're connected. It does. How many times have you run into somebody out of town who came from the same town as you? They're wearing a sports hat or a, a shirt, you know, with the, the logo of the town or the college. I've had people come up to me in an airport, run up to me saying, oh, uh, you're from this building that I live in. N- I, they never said hi to me in the 12 years. Of, yeah. Is it, well, I, I'll tell you what. I used to go to all the Stanford football games because my two – I call them my boys, both. I'm their grandma, Susan, but they played football for Stanford. In a sea of red, there was one guy wearing a University of Illinois hat. And I went up to him and said, well, what was their campus phrase, Askiwawa? This stranger in the middle of that stadium gave me a big hug. The two, you know, Big Ten Illinois people. It's who would have thought? There is something that happens, especially if you're in another country. And you, I read people say to me, I, okay, so I was on a trip in Australia going blah, blah, blah on this tour. And they meet someone from the town over that they never knew before. Yeah. And they end up being friends when they get back home. Yeah. So, folks, here's what we're saying. It's not just working a room. It's really about meeting, greeting, connecting, and All the research shows that the people 
who keep their health and keep their mind are people that have relationships. This is a book, this is a a thing to do that builds relationships. But if you don't nurture those relationships and stay in touch, you got nothing. It isn't enough to meet people, but when you find a connection or interest or the way you could do business together, don't be a prom king or queen. Don't wait for people to follow up with you. Um, actually, um, uh, I'm just going to forget. I just forgot his name. Virgin. Um, Branson. Joe, oh, Richard yeah, Branson. Yeah. Richard Branson quoted me in one of his, uh, uh, I guess, posts that he put out uh, of things to remember. And it, it's not um, good things come to those who wait. What I said is good things come to those who initiate. That's a great one. That's a great way to end this interview. I appreciate your time, Susan. Where do people go to learn about you, your book, and uh, connect with you? Okay. You can go to um, S-U-S-A-N-R-O-A-N-E, SusanRoan.com. If you want, if you have a question that's come up, I mean, I'm a former teacher, so we don't like anyone to have like heartburn from having a question unanswered, email me, susan at susanroan.com. And if you want to hire me to speak for your company or your organization, how's this? 415-461-3915. Operators aren't waiting. I answer (laughs) my phone. phone. Operators are off tonight. (laughs) I kind of stole that from Stephen Colbert. But, um, and I see how I credited someone else with my good line. Call me if you have a question. It's okay. I'm good. I'm leaving the country in a couple weeks, but I got two more weeks to answer your questions, and I'll always answer um, via email. Also, the book, you can go online and order if that's what you choose, but I'm going to make the pitch. You've got local bookstores. They'll get it to you in two, three days. Support your local bookstores. I wouldn't be a number one best-selling author from Book of the Month Club and on a list, lists, legitimate lists all around the country if it weren't for your independent bookstores. Hey, I hope you enjoyed that interview. I really enjoyed it, and I've moved it up in my queue to get it out there as soon as possible because in Q4, this is the time to really expand our network. And I think we overlooked this. I think we're doing a lot online, but when we get the opportunity to be face-to-face with people, even strangers, being able to just become good at it, try this at a party, try you know, moving around, connecting up with people, because you really don't know who everybody else knows. And expanding your network, being a connector, like uh, Malcolm Gladwell's uh, depiction in uh, The Tipping Point. You might want to check out that book. It's a great book. Um, It's kind of anecdotal, but it it really helps you understand how people and things catch fire, how you get your game to go from linear to exponential. And networking and other people and helping other people is the way to do that. So I really enjoyed that. I hope you did as well. I want to make sure you're checking out the show notes. Connect up with me on LinkedIn. I really appreciate everybody who's sharing, liking, commenting on my content there. Follow the pages, the company pages, the Brutal Truth page, uh, the B2B Revenue page, and the Sales Questions page. (laughs) I have this career advice podcast. It's a labor of love because a lot of the questions I get from people are about careers, and it, it just bugs me as a human being to see people's careers go in the wrong direction, to stay in the wrong industry for too long, to get stuck at the wrong geography or the the comfortable trap of a nice company with a decent paycheck, but isn't what you want to do. And the whole idea of the podcast is for me to share what I've seen work and not work and to kind of wake people up if they're stuck in a trap and to kind of break some of the myths that I see about education and training and skills. And what I see is hot because what we have to do is become good at what's going to be needed 
it's really three years from now because that's the minimum amount of time it's going to take to become really an A player at it. And that's why I came up with the courses because these are the two major things that I see wrong today is people are just struggling to get that initial conversation started that can either qualify into a meeting or qualify out is that they're not interested, they're not a match, good luck and God bless. And then the second part is understanding how to close the complex sale. Nobody teaches this. Everybody in the course is talking about, you know, this this is so much deeper than I ever thought. And it's not just how to do it, it or what to do or how it works. You get the access to people who are actually doing it. You get to see how other people are doing it. And it's all about prevention and planning and understanding that you're playing a game. Too many of us are just playing a part of the game. We become very good at part of the game, but we ignore the rest of it and we get stuck in these traps. So I'm here to help you out with that. So check that all out at b2brevenue.com. If you want to talk it over, I have 15 minute slots. Now, these are not consultations or career advice or how you doing calls. These are, hey, I'm interested in the course. I've checked it out. I've listened to at least five podcasts. I think it matches what I'm doing, but I just want to talk to you before I, I dive in. 100% agree. I have questions. I, I, I'm not sure I understand it. Perfectly fine. Then please show up <laughs> when you schedule the time because my time's pretty valuable. Anybody who doesn't show will never get another opportunity. Is that mean? Probably. <laughs> Sorry about that. It's just uh, time's becoming precious. Hey, I really appreciate everything. We'll see you next time. Hey, everybody. Thanks for listening to this episode. And I really will appreciate everybody who goes on to LinkedIn, connects up with me or follows me there. If you happen to see some of my content flying by, if you could throw a little thumbs up or a comment or a share, I definitely appreciate it. It helps spread the word about the podcast. And make sure you're checking out my website, b2brevenue.com. You can get my free book on how companies make product selections. It's a real book. Uh, it was on, it is on Amazon, but I give it away for free. Just register there. It'll email you a link to it and you can just download the PDF from there. Also, if you want to check out the courses, start the conversation, get the meeting or closing the complex sale and you have more questions about it. The short answer is there are video courses. You get access for a year, but it's also a community. What does that mean? You can ask questions anytime via voicemail or email. I answer them within a week, put them into the course. We have office hours every other week. It's an hour long. We course where you can basically, I pick a topic, answer questions. You can ask questions. Also, you can schedule one-on-ones for free, and we just talk through your particular use case, and that gets shared with the course. So if you don't have time for office hours or the timing doesn't work, or you just want some more one-on-one help, that's all included for a whole year. So it's really a a year to go from where you are to where you want to be. And so it's not just videos. It's not just knowledge. It's practice. It's getting feedback. You can send me emails. You can send me uh, your presentation. I'll help you with anything that you need to close the complex sale or get the meeting. And you can check out them at b2brevenue.com. So that's it. I really appreciate it. And please tell somebody about the podcast and let me know if I can help you in any way. Oh, and you want to hear some results from the course? Well, here you go. You you know, I love the approach. It's working for me just fantastic. If I sent you some of the emails, which I should, the conversations that I'm having with people, I, I think you'd be blown away because they're not really about work. Yeah. I've figured out if you can kind of get personal with them, like one lady, it's all about her family, kids. And then I sprinkled in a little bit around work and she's LinkedIn sending me messages on LinkedIn, <laughs> photos of her family. Um, no, I'm not even kidding. I should show this to you. You'd be stunned. I was shocked. And we're going, she, she even, we're going to lunch on September 6th. And yesterday <laughs> she shot me a LinkedIn message and said, Hey, Ron, why don't we get on the phone and do a video call beforehand so our lunch isn't so awkward? We're like barely not meeting each other for the first time. <laughs> oh, holy cow, right? Like, this is unbelievable. So this is not the first time that this has happened. She's kind of an extreme, yeah. but um, I'm starting to figure out a pattern where I can actually make this a process, you know? 
So good, good. Yeah. I'll show you that. So it, it's getting to that point. And I'm kind of, every time I do this, I'm like, God, this is unbelievable. You know? So, and it feels better too, doesn't it? Oh, right. Let me tell you something to be able to go, go to lunch with her. I'll even talk to her on the phone, right? We're going to talk about, uh, family, kids, work-life harmony. Cause we read, a, I shared a thing with her from Bezos about work-life harmony. This is where the conversation will start. Now, at some point we're both not stupid, right? We know we're going to talk about work and <laughs> we know why we're both there. Right. But to kick it off this way is so much better. And to end that lunch with the last five to eight minutes of telling, you know, well, what are you guys doing with digital? 